to answer, you know? Yeah. Um, and then after, if we can put them in the chat once, like, Brendan has the whiteboard up, because I'll be able to see it, so. I got access to the chat, too. Uh, okay, cool. So, real quick, also, the Google Doc that I just sent is everything that we have here on the whiteboard. Uh, we have our movement prep, power strength, conditioning, and, and all of our categories and buckets that we're going to be filling in with our case studies. So you can follow along. My wife, Jenny, is going to be filling out that spreadsheet with everything that's up here. You can follow along or you could print that out right now if you wanted or download it for yourself in an Excel sheet so that you can fill it out as we go along, however you want to do that. So that's why that link is there. Uh, if you want access to what's going on on the whiteboard here. Go for cool. it. All right. So real, I mean, this is a real simple uh, keynote. I pretty much just put in three real clients that I see um, on a weekly basis. Um, they're all very unique from one another in that they have different backgrounds or different ages, different goals. Um, but it would give us kind of a well-rounded approach to looking at programming uh, with a few different situations. And what I'll do is I'll kind of go through their actual assessment notes. I tried to just parse down from their actual intake that I have um, down to kind of the key things um, that are gonna dictate how we adjust their program um, one way or the other. And then we'll go into the programming piece with Brendan and we'll actually build those out. Um, it's important to realize, like, again, these are people I see in a group setting um, and in a rehab setting. Um, so th I think they were very good examples in that like we can use the CFSC system to work with these people, even though you'll see when we get to them, they all have some sort of uh, injury or limitation or difference in goals, but we're able to use that CFSC program. So I tried to choose people that I thought were very good examples um, specifically, but these are people who are, who are on my, my, weekly, my weekly schedule at MBSC. So. Um, so we'll go right into the first case study. The, the pictures are just pictures uh, that I found uh, on the internet. These aren't the actual people. But uh, <laughs> I tried to find someone who kind of represented the person uh, that I was talking about. But these are just like stock photos on the internet. Uh, so case study number one uh, is a 50-year-old female. She's a teacher, English teacher in uh, K through 12. And so, you know, she's moderately active. She just started at the gym about a year ago um, in conversation with her. One of the main things she was focused on, what brought her to the gym and what her outcome a year from now ideally would be losing some weight. She's someone who's kind of battled with weight loss. Um, and much like uh, a lot of women in that population, just in her mind has, you know, 10 pounds that she wants to lose not someone who's excessively overweight, but that's, that's her, that was her number one goal. She voiced to me uh, coming in. Uh, the reason she was seeing me in movement as medicine, in addition to starting to come into groups, um, uh, was to reduce hip, ankle, and back pain. She had pretty chronic um, issues all on her right side specifically, and we'll get into those a little bit more specifically in a second. Also, she's someone who runs uh, pretty regularly two or three times a week, not that far, maybe like three miles. Um, but enjoys the activity more so than actually she enjoys coming and lifting. She's lifting because she knows it's good for her. And uh, she, she thought it would make her feel better. But uh, mainly she wants to improve running performance, wants to just be in slightly better shape and, and, and be able to do those things without pain. Um, kind of going through her subjective input when I ask her, like, what are her symptoms? Um, right ankle pain. Um, achy at the end of the day, especially it starts to ache and get sore. Sometimes the foot and ankle get swollen. Um, right anterior hip pain, um, worse post run. So after her running, it's, it can be worse. Sometimes she needs to make sure she rolls and stretches to kind of get ahead of that. It might ache or so a day or so later. Um, and right lower back pain also sometimes achy at the end of the day. Someone who's teaching up and down, spending a lot of time on her feet. Um, so, you know, by the end of the day, sometimes these things hurt. Um, subjectively, these are the things when I asked her, tell me about your symptoms that, that how she kind of described them all re relatively achy, sometimes a little bit of sharp pain, um, in the front of the hip. Um, and I'll kind of, we'll kind of get into why that is here in the objective when I take in her actual objective medical history, um, right ankle reconstructed surgery 10 years ago, she broke her ankle, had to get that reconstructed. Um, and so that ankle you know, ever since then has been really achy, pretty achy and stiff. Been through, went through a formal physical therapy rehab, but it's still dealing with um, some mobility limitations and 
uh, some achiness uh, pretty much day to day. Uh, about one year ago, she had a right hip labral repair. So we kind of see a pattern um, already taking place here um, as far as, you know, right side issues going on. Um, had that labral repair, went through a formal rehab, again, still dealing with some stiffness and soreness. She's able to run, but obviously there are some problems there. Um, and then even further back, double mastectomy, breast cancer 12 years prior. So um, a fairly complicated medical history. You see a number of things on the right side, all things to take note on regarding her mobility and her ability to, you know, do certain movements within the weight room. Um, and what we'll do next is get into her actual um, movement assessment and her strength assessment, what I looked at when she came in to see me um, in the clinic. And I kind of pulled her out of the groups to kind of look at a couple of things. So Brenda, anybody have any questions so far? Not so far. I haven't seen any uh, hands raised or anything in the chat. All right. So kind of getting in a little bit deeper, like that was just her, uh, some notable things from the front side of her questionnaire. Um, again, run activities. I always want to see like, what does your activity look like? One of my main questions is like, right now, what does a day, a normal week of exercise look for you, look like for you? So run or walk, depending on how she feels. Some days she runs, some days she walks, but she has about a three mile route she does two or three days a week. Um, she goes to the gym two or three days a week. That was again, recent. Like I started seeing her shortly after she came to the gym and joined to the groups, um, two to three days, depending on what her schedule allows. So she's fairly active, um, but we're trying to get her into a strength training program that fits her. We don't want to put a square peg in a round hole. And she has obviously some significant issues that are not back to normal yet. Um, teacher schedule on her feet most of the day. She's been on a weekly nutrition guidance program uh, where she checks in with a nutritionist, logs her food, and that's something she's been doing for a pretty long time to help maintain the weight that she wants. And again, she wants to continue improving that and came to us um, for more guidance than that. Um, as far as her orthopedics, I put her through an SFMA because she came in presenting, you know, some chronic pain. Again, not completely limiting, but it does bug her and limits the amount of running that she likes to do. And she had mentioned there were some things in the weight room that she could not do. So um, the major things that stood out when I looked at her SFMA, um, and if you guys aren't familiar, it's just the version of the FMS you want to use for people who are currently um, in pain. Um, so it's just uh, kind of like a more uh, yeah, comprehensive version of the FMS uh, for a medical scenario. So in looking at her toe touch, meaning she's standing up on her feet, you know, feet together, bending down, reaching to touch her toes, knees straight, uh, painful, limited right hip flexion. She couldn't touch her toes initially. So what I did is I broke it out. I looked at her hip flexion, laying in supine on the table at end range on that right side where she had the labral repair. She had some pretty typical pinching, um, FAI type symptoms um, in the anterior hip, limited when looking at her internal rotation um, in that hip specifically, um, and stability motor control limitation in her pelvis, meaning like she has trouble controlling her pelvis in space. If I look at like a cat camel and some pelvic tilting, uh, generally when I first took her on intake, some issues with that. So something to take note of there, we need some pelvic motor control and just limited right hip flexion. So, so we had to restore that quality. Um, mostly limitations from her having that uh, arthroscopic labral repair. Um, so something to think about there. Um, extension. Uh, going down, I looked at her extension screen as well. So feet together, knees straight, bending backwards as far as she can, trying to reach the wall behind her. Uh, limitation in the anterior front hip in hip and pelvic extension, painful um, in that position. Again, limitations from that labral repair on the right. And then uh, stood out pretty obviously in her squat screen. Um, she had limited right dorsiflexion when I broke that out and looked at it on the table. Ankle was still fairly limited, lots of scar tissue. Uh, it was a, oh, it was a that surgery was done about 10 years ago, I believe, 12 years ago, I think, so I wrote. Um, and that ankle was uh, pretty stiff, so uh, limited dorsiflexion. In watching her walk, I had her just kind of do some basic gait analysis. You can see that she walks actively around that right ankle. Um, because of the limited dorsiflexion, you can see her foot tracks out. Um, if you ever seen me walk, that's what my left side looks like. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's literally the same pattern as me. Um, and what that opened my eyes up to also is because with myself, I know I sometimes get anterior right hip issues. 
Um, so she tends to walk and run around that, that dorsiflexion, that ankle. So it's not a surprise to me um, that she ended up with a labral issue, probably on that right side of that hip, because 10, 12 years earlier, she, she's been wa- working with a running consistently three days a week with an ankle that doesn't really move well. Um, so that stress, I think, I, pro- I, I can't say with any uh, certainty that that's why, but in watching her move, I, I would not be surprised if, if we got to that labral issue because of the, the ankle limitation beforehand. Um, so things to take note of, definitely need to improve that right dorsiflexion. Um, uh, li- also some limitation in her right toe extension, which I, I think that might've got cut off on the PowerPoint, but I, I just know from my experience, her right toe is also limited in extension, um, probably because she has not towed off and dorsiflexed through that ankle in some time. Um, and then some, uh, obviously some, some, uh, hip mobility and pelvic control stuff we need to work on regarding that labor. Uh, prior to seeing us, no real strength training background, uh, had really just done, uh, done running, uh, used an elliptical, ran on the treadmill, ran outside. Um, I take her through what I call like a basic, uh, entry level workout to kind of see what they do. Um, so we'll go through like all the basic patterns, squat, hinge, split squat, single leg stance, single leg deadlift, just to try to get a feel of how does she look moving around, how comfortable they in the gym. It also gives them a, uh, kind of lets them get comfortable with our program. Um, pretty obvious from the get go, like just looking at her, seeing her do single leg stance type things that her single leg hip stability need to work. Now, obviously we're working with, uh, probably some poor proprioceptive input, just do the limitations in that hip and side of the pelvis anyhow. Um, so I think as that stuff gets better and we start to be able to feed her into some more of those single leg activities as the hip gets better, then we'll, we'll be able to do that. Um, specifically painful, no splits position stuff. Split squat was no good um, on either uh, side. For, both sides? Um, I, I, so it says left hip and this should be right hip and toe. Um, it, it's, it was painful on the right on both sides. Um, so specifically when the right leg was back, she could feel it a lot in the front like kind of pinching, uh, I mean, kind of like pulling on the front. Uh, when that right leg was forward, she was getting that FAI type symptom at the bottom, right? Whereas in goblet squat, she actually felt okay. Like I had to do a squat press out, not a problem. Um, so that told me right then and there, okay, we, we can't do any split positions, uh, split position stuff yet. Um, but we can maybe start with a goblet squat and we can maybe start with some bilateral hinging, Um, and some easy reaching work, like single leg reaching. She was on a deadlift. She was fine, uh, wobbly, but it didn't hurt. Right. Um, so the red light, the only real red light we had was she couldn't touch her toes yet. So we had to restore that at the beginning. I didn't want her deadlifting uh, until we restored that. And I didn't want her in any split position work. Um, I also didn't want her doing any impact activities, um, until we kind of get that stuff, uh, cleared out. So we, I mean, we could just basically do some basic core stuff, some med ball stuff, Plenty to get her started. Upper body pressing was a little weak, but not painful. And basic core strength kind of needed work. So if we kind of think about uh, what our red lights are, anything where we have to toe off um, on that right side, anything in split position, any impact. But from there, we can probably start with some real entry level stuff um, on there. So Brendan, would it be better if we go and we program this person and then yeah. we go to case Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again? That's perfect. Okay. Let's program her first. So if you stop your screen share, Yep, I'll do that. That way, am I full screen now? Can anyone confirm that? You. you can? Oh, never mind. My wife can. Um, cool. Okay. So, actually, real quick, uh, there was a question about is, SF, is the SFMA available for trainers? Yeah. Yeah. You can take it. Um, you might not be certified in it at the end. You could take it online, level one. You could take it in person, level one um as a trainer it's just an assessment strategy it's not a treatment strategy so you are perfectly fine to take it it's just a more stretched out version of the fms to look break down movement more so um i i recommend our trainers to take it um i've been trying to get especially the older ones yeah yeah it's just, and, and it it just helps you look at those patterns in the fms better too so in my opinion i think it's valuable yeah, I mean, I look at SF, I look at the FMS as macro <coughs> movement, like gross mm-hmm. movement of all the joints, and the SFMA is just a breakdown of micro movement, or all the joints or pat, or all the little movements that go into a pattern. Um, so it just allows you to make a better decision. Like you said, you're not certified in it, but anyone can take it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I don't think I, we got any other questions. Um, case number one, even though she enjoys running as a regular activity, do you recommend her to stop running throughout the first phase of her training while progressing her to, through the correctives? Great question. Yeah, very good. So what I did, and this was a hard battle with her uh, for two reasons. One, she's a runner. Uh, so like she didn't want to stop running as most runners uh, are. And like they always pretty stubborn with that. Naturally, also her personality, she's very outspoken. I'll just tell you from a personal standpoint. So I was like, you, I, I, I knew right away I couldn't say stop running. Yeah. I, what I said to her was, can you just choose to walk for a few weeks? Right? Because I had to kind of figure the battle I win. So if I could just Yeah, you're meeting her where she's at. Yeah, so I said, can you just do me a favor and just choose to walk instead of run for the next few weeks until we kind of get you to a point where you can deal with the stress of running? And she was fine with that because I knew if I had said, Hey, you're going to just stop running. She would have told me to go screw myself probably. <laughs> so, uh, that, then that's, that's where we settled. I said, just walk for the next few weeks. I think you're going to feel a lot better. And then from there, uh, we'll be able to pick that intensity back up. Cool. Um, all right. And anyone else have any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Nothing in the question box. Yeah. I'll repost the link in a minute. Oh, uh, real quick with you. So I get this question a lot. Uh, what is the like beginning workout that you take everyone through? Do you want to actually program that first? So say it's your first yeah. day. What is an example program that you take? Like you said, like, so you have your true like physical or your true assessment, which is your FMS or your SFMA. Yep. Now our second assessment is actually taking you through the workout where we get you comfortable and going into the gym. Um, and do it. they're generally exercises that every single person can do. So if you use the same workout with everybody day one, then you can, it's technically a screen because you can judge it based off of all the other people that you've trained. So real quick, I'm just going to go to the whiteboard. Uh, you've got the SFMA. So Kev, we can work together here. Am I full screen, everybody? I'm full screen. All right, cool. So uh, first thing I'm going to take them through. So I got these pretty cool magnets that go on the whiteboard here. So it just says squat, but what version of the squat are we going to do? Um, I like to use the number, uh, the 80-20 number or Prado's principle. So what are 80% of your people going to be able to start with the first day into the gym is a goblet squat. So we have squat here, right? So we have goblet squat. So again, this is the first workout you take every single person through. Now we're going to do, because we generally only have an hour or maybe even less on their first day because people are getting accommodated with the gym and how it works and this there's a lot more explaining to do in the first workout. So actually we got probably 30 minutes of true exercise. So we're just gonna do two sets of eight. And then based off of what that person looks like or presents or what you took from their intake, you're going to pick a weight that you think they can handle for their first set so that they have success for eight reps. And then where you go from here, if you have someone that you don't think can handle reps, you use your regressions, which would be your body weight squats, your assisted squats. So already from this first workout, uh, also an assessment workout that we take every the same person through, we're going to get a lot of information from that. Next one, I would probably, or not probably, I do go to push up. So we're going to do something for our legs, something for our upper body, and then push ups. Again, it's going to be two sets of eight. Can they do regular push-ups on the ground? Do they need to do push-ups with their hands elevated? And again, we're taking notes. So now if they go into an adult group, I can share with the coach like, hey, uh, when she's in your group tomorrow for the first day, she needs to be doing push-ups or on a, on a bench or on a, on a rack. Um, or, hey, he's really good at push-ups. He did two sets of eight, nailed it. Make them harder for him or her, okay? Uh, my next drill is just going to be a front plank. And... I'm going to share with everyone later the checklist product that I just put out. It's a, uh, we, I, in there, I have all our standards for each exercise and our standard is 60 seconds. 
So can you hold a front plank for 60 seconds, yes or no? If it's good, make it harder, body saw, wheel roll up. If it's not 60 seconds, then we need to regress it, which would just probably be less time. But again, we're, it's another assessment tool. So two sets of 60 seconds. Are you putting this in the sheet? No. Make a, uh, this is a, an assessment workout. So this would be my first tricep. Jenny's gonna put this in the sheet for everyone so you could have your, your assessment first training session. Uh, anything to add to this tricep, Kevin, before I make the second tricep? No, that's, that's good. Generally, like Brenda was saying, I like to try to see a measure of general lower body strength, which you get with goblet squat, uh, general upper body strength and anti-extension core strength. So those are good entry level, right? And I guess the one little thing I would say about that is I think your context matters. So like, I would say in, in my context, the first time I see someone on one-on-one, -on -one, it's usually in a pain situation because most of my one-on-one -on -one clients are someone who come out of movement as medicine and go into the gym in a, a rehab context. So typically I might see them on a slightly more regressed version of that, right? Uh, because just because of my context is different, but it's essentially the same program. So essentially like my goblet squat is usually a squat press out uh, because it's probably someone coming from rehab. Um, my push up is a push up and then front plank is probably front plank it just depends on uh, what they're doing. So it might could be a modified front plank like an incline or from their knees or in a bare, bare position, but looking at those same three qualities, uh, maybe just on a more regressed version. So we got a question, is there a particular order? No particular order, but we want to do is something for your upper body, something for your lower body, something for your core. And then the next round I have a quad set. So we have single leg deadlift for two sets of eight. So now we get to see how they move on one leg. Uh, split squat, we get to see how they move on one leg, two sets of eight. Again, use your regressions or progressions. Uh, dumbbell row, two sets of eight on your first workout. And then anti-rotation holds in tall kneeling. Everyone starts there for two sets of 10 second holds on each side. Now, this could also be or TRX row. The cool thing about these exercises, again, is 80% of your people are gonna be totally cool to start here and not have a problem with that. So that means that when somebody comes in for their first day, you know exactly what you're doing with them, and then you can judge their movements and their how they're doing based off of what you've seen other people do on their first day. So now you know the next time they come into the gym, I'll have a much better idea of where we should begin and where we should go, or if they're joining into a group, you have a much better starting place, and you can have that conversation with the, whoever their head coach is and say, hey, uh, Kevin, when he came to his first uh, exam or his first assessment training session, he goblet squatted uh, 15 and had to do a press out. Uh, he did he did two sets of eight push ups. His front plank he only front planked for 20 seconds. Uh, his single leg deadlift wasn't very good. His balance is off. Uh, he, he his knees are bent. He's kind of opening his hips, so he's going to need a lot regression there. Uh, split squats, he was okay. We did TRX row, he was okay. And tall kneeling anti rotation holds, he was okay. So that you get so much information. So don't feel like you have to have, uh, you don't have to have a crazy elaborate assessment process. You don't have to do the FMS or the SFMA. We like it because we tease a lot of this stuff out beforehand. But just have a program that you use with everybody all the time and you'll get really, really good at screening for your program that you're gonna take them through. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna answer a question here that Jordan uh, Baum had in the, it's gonna be easier if I say it uh, verbally than if I type it. So she asked, you know, what is my typical assessment when you first see someone, uh, not, a, not a workout, but an actual evaluation. So um, I'll, I'll run through it. So, I mean, they, they all fill out an intake that's pretty thorough. Um, about their lifestyle, their pain, their exercise levels, all of those things. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through that first. Then I'll actually have that same conversation with them. Um, you get, a lot can be kind of gained just from talking, um, mainly because if I get them talking, they'll usually tell me a lot more than they'll write on the paper. 
um, kind of gleam a lot of things from that. Then when it's time to actually start looking at things, I use an SFMA to kind of get a big picture view. And then I always say you zoom in your focus from there. Uh, without a doubt, you need to do more than just uh, SFMA. You got to like break down those joints. But if you do the SFMA properly, it teaches you how to do that. Um, I think Claypole sometimes give FMS or SFMA a bad name because they think you just look at the gross movement patterns. But if you follow the instructions the way it's meant to be done, um, it zooms in. So I'll, I'll go through the SFMA and I'll start to zoom in on, on the breakouts they're called. So see where the limitations are, look at their isolated hip, isolated shoulder, mobility, motor control, whatever it might be. Um, and then from there, um, you know, I, I probably do some sort of treatment. If there's a mobility limitation, uh, if, there's a, if it's indicated via SFMA takes you to certain outcomes, whether it's soft tissue outcome, uh, joint mobility outcome, motor control outcome. If there's a soft tissue indication or a pain management indication, then I'll probably do some manual work. If it's going to help them be able to do their motor control drills better, do their mobility drills better. Um, I'll get them moving better. And then if there's still time in that session, if it's the initial session or the second session maybe, then I'll go through kind of that entry level workout because I want them to start to kind of have the mindset um, of exercise as soon as possible um, so they don't get attached to the idea that everything's going to be me working on them on the table. Um, I want it to be as much of an active process as possible. So the sooner I can get them into some sort of modified entry level workout like Brendan talked about, um, they, can start to, they can start to move along that line. Um, and yeah, Brian said it's unique is that I am an LMT. Now, if you're a trainer, okay, your intake will still be this. You could probably still do an SFMA, but you're just not going to, when your outcomes in your SFMA come to management of pain or uh, manual techniques, then you refer out, but you could probably still have a lot of tools at your disposal as a trainer to do trainer things, right? And when you get an outcome that needs a therapist or someone with manual te techniques, you have them do that, but you can still get people better um, in any of those patterns that might be limited from a motor control or a soft tissue extensibility standpoint with, tr with the tools that you have as a trainer. So um, I think you can follow a very similar outcome, just the way you treat people, you just don't have the manual techniques at your disposal, which are a small part of what I do as a coach. I would say it's the smallest part of what I do as a coach and a therapist is the manual work. The majority of what I do is, is uh, exercise-based work, um, just kind of applied at the right time. Also, the workout that we just did, at, at the very least, you if you use a consistent workout program, I mean, ideally, yeah, you'd have the, the, the FMS screen and the SFMA and whatnot, um, but you can also, right, you can outsource those things to somebody who does those things for a living as well. Mm -hmm. um, bunch of questions about the CFSC regression progression sheet. Uh, we're taking down all the emails right now. So if someone should want that, I can get that to you later. The I'm actually currently updating it for the CFSC website right now. So there will be an updated version. I still have to talk to you, Kev, and Mike to mm -hmm. finalize that. Um, so Jenny is taking down everyone's emails if you're if you're throwing them in there right now. Uh, okay, let's program for this. This uh, What was her name? Does she have a name or is it just case study one? It's case study one. Case study one. Okay, let's give her a name. Carol. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay, it's Carol. Carol. Uh, all right. Now, the big thing was that there's no split squats, right? That was the, the number one red flag. Yeah, that was one that was that, that was definitely a red light for her. It did not, well, did not feel good. Okay, so if everyone has that sheet available to them, what you're looking at here is that sheet. So over here, we have foam roll, soft tissue, stretch mobility, motor control and corrective, and dynamic warm-up which fall under movement prep. Oh, you can't see me. There we go. Fall under movement prep. That's going to be about the first 25 to 40 minutes of our program, depending on the, uh, if it's more of an adult, they need more movement prep. If it's more of an athlete, athletes need probably less movement prep and more time spent on speed and strength work. So again, 20 to 35 minutes is going to be your warm up stuff. Down here, I made three different blocks. So the first block is an upper body explosive, a lower body explosive, and a core or a corrective exercise. Uh, on our second block is a quad set, 
hip dominant, knee dominant, and it's going to be bilateral. Down here in 3A is going to be unilateral. So we're trying to get in a bilateral pattern and a unilateral pattern every day. Push pull, we have horizontal push pull, we have vertical push pull. We try to get one of those in each day. We have anti extension and then anti rotation and lateral flexion. And then down here, I have in D, and I have an open exercise. What I mean by that is you, it's kind of like a wild card. So it could be core, corrective, push, pull, hip, knee, explosive. Now, that is a lot of stuff. You don't have to write something in for all of them. All you're doing here is you're creating a template that helps you decide where I insert these strength exercises so that we get in all of our movement patterns each week. Now, Carol here, we're going to write up 90% of your people are going to train with you twice a week. Some people will train three days a week. Rarely will you ever have anyone who has enough money or time to pay you and come to the gym for four or five days a week. If you do have that type of person, you're probably going to be writing the program for home because they won't be coming into the gym to do it. Most people are going to be two days a week. So we want to make sure we get in all of our movement patterns two or three days a week. So the other thing you can see down here is we have conditioning. Now I put conditioning into three different buckets. It's the no impact bucket, which is gonna be your bike, your row, your walk. There is the low impact bucket, which is your jogging and maybe some Metcom work, some sled pushing. And then our high impact, which is almost always sprinting or jumping. So you have three different types of impact conditioning. Uh, athletes are going to be need more of the high impact stuff and the adults are going to probably be more in the no impact or low impact. Um, so that's how we categorize everything. Those are the buckets we're working with. So Kevin with, uh, Carol here based off of her stuff. So other than like, a, just a normal traditional, like foam roll, all your stuff, what mm -hmm. extra soft tissue stuff do you have her doing? Like, yep. Um, I spend... I spend extra time on her anterior hip uh, with the Rolga, like the ball part of the Rolga. Um, and I have her spend extra time on the, the lower legs. So posterior, uh, lower calf, Achilles, lateral ankle area as well. Cause those two areas are specifically have a lot of scar tissue, but they're just, there's a lot of resting tone in that tissue because of their, the, the tension there. So just a lot of, a uh, lot of resting neurological tension there. All right, cool. So, for soft tissue and foam roll, I have well, I have just a regular traditional foam roll with some extra anterior hip and posterior calf work. That will be about what three to five minutes, and hopefully uh, she comes in early and does it. Yeah. Uh, someone just asked if this is going to be recorded. Um, it's recorded. Are you recording it? Yeah, and we'll we'll post it up later. So if you got to go, it's cool. All right, I'm just checking. Um, stretch and mobility any specific stretch or mobility stuff yeah i mean we used we do all like the kind of stuff we do teach in the cert we do 90 90 we do posterior hip rock it's especially important for um with that anterior hip pain opening up the posterior capsule is uh uh is pretty valuable for her um a lot of we do extra ankle mobility work every day um in that we do the wall ankle we do ankle mobility on the box, and we do articular rotations, flexion, extension, rotation of the of the ankle daily. So you said wall. What was it? Wall. Wall box. Wall box. And then the circles and flexion extension. Got it. And those sometimes are worked into the lift. Like we're always doing something in the warm up, but like where Brendan said, like extra for filler. Like sometimes I have her active rest be like her ankle cars or her wall ankle and stuff like that. So that way it, I don't have to always jam it in because a lot of times she's in a group. Like she sees me once a week for like treatment slash training, but then she comes in a group. So I need her to be able to do this in a group setting and I can't have her be like going off rogue when a group is coming. So I kind of just say, hey, squeeze in one of these in the warm up. And then I want you to kind of replace something or add it as active rest during the lift. Um, and that's kind of how we can start to s provide specific interventions in a general setting like this. Well, the two things I like that you said there was one, we know what she's gonna do for her open exercise now. So I'm gonna put that down here and open. 
and mm -hmm. I'm just gonna write extra ankle. And I really have focused on the ankle because, like I said, in watching her walk, I could tell that I think a lot of that hip stress came from the fact that she watch, she externally rotates that hip to get around the fact that she can't toe off and can't dorsiflex, which limited, which is why I think she put so much stress on that labrum. So to me, like I, I looked at the hip and it was a pretty typical FAI turned labral tear. Um, where I, I said, like, listen, if I could get her ankle better, I bet this hip feels better. So I really tried to look at, okay, this ankle is extra stiff. Let's spend time on trying to get this ankle open. And I also like that you said, uh, what was the second thing I was going to say? I'm not remembering now. Sorry, it'll come up to me. Yeah. Uh, so Rob asked, uh, do we have two, three, four day uh, templates? The template I gave you is for two, three, four, five, six days. We follow this same temperate template every single day. It's just uh, what the exercises we select are different. Again, I'm not going to fill in every single one of these. We only have an hour, um, but we're trying to get in most of these things. If you do have someone that comes four or five days a week, I don't try to do as much of this, and I try to spread these out more over that four or five days so I can focus more on certain patterns. What we're trying to do though, if you only come twice a week, which is most of your people, is get all of our movement patterns in so that we're not missing anything. Um, okay, so motor control and corrective, anything specific here? What's really good is like the stuff that she needs is stuff that we do in the group anyways. So supine breathing to get in her pelvis, uh, kind of some better motor control of her pelvis, uh, cat camel, uh, leg lower are all things that are in the group. Um, but those are things that she specifically needs attention with. So really like in our sessions, I kind of coach her up really hard on these so that when she gets into the group, she can hit the ground running. Got it. Uh, okay. Dynamic warm up. Um, I just, um, I had her pull back at least on the impact. Uh, so she kind of did all the dynamic stretching. Um, but when they started to do lots of skipping and high knee run and uh, stuff like that, at least initially, um, I said, why don't you just kind of uh, go off the side and do a little bit more dynamic stretching. And what's ironic is like, then this kind of became her rehab after, like, because she needed to get uh, better at this stuff. Um, but initially we pulled it out. Oh. I'm going to answer Sean's question. Sean Crane asked real quick. Uh, he noticed Ankle inversion, eversion is rarely included in CFSC. Can you explain and discuss? Um, I don't, we don't put it in the group at, in a rehab setting. Uh, if someone is limited, especially in eversion, I see a much more limitations in eversion. I almost never see them in inversion. I'll, I'll have people work at it, but it just goes back to the 80 20 uh, situation where, like, you, I would say it's about 90 10. About 97% of people come in with dorsiflexion limitations, then maybe. 8% come in with an eversion limitation, and then maybe that 2% come in with an inversion limitation from what I see. Now, if there's someone who has frequent sprains or scar tissue or issues with that lateral portion of the ankle, maybe you need to work on inversion and do some contractile acts. But just as far as the group setting in the majority of people we see, we just don't see that many of them. Yeah. Um, I know what I was going to say about the ankle now. I like that uh, because like you said, she's in a group setting as well. She doesn't have you all the time. When you teach people how to do this anterior hip, posterior calf, and ankle stuff, she knows exactly what she needs to do as filler exercises when she's in the group. So it's almost like homework, and also you're teaching her how to kind of take care of herself. Yeah. Um, and that she doesn't do anything that she shouldn't be doing. Um, I got a good question, too, with, the, uh, with that first workout that we did, the example one, the uh, assessment workout that you do with people. Yes, I would still take them through a foam roll and a couple stretches, but I don't take them through the whole dynamic warm up. I want to see how they move in the gym. And it's just based off of logistics and time. Most people, because you come in, they talk to you for a little bit, you try to get to know them, you're showing them where the cubbies are, where the bathrooms are. We only have a half hour to work out, and I would rather them get in some strength stuff and sweat and maybe get a little sore than I would to try to take them through all that beginning stuff, like the foam roll, stretch, activate, uh, dynamic warm up. That can all come in the second and third workout. So that was a good question, whoever. Mm -hmm. I lost whoever asked for that. 
Um, okay, so we got our warm up. We got lower control. Okay, let's go to strength. Does she do any upper body explosive stuff? Uh, yeah, she can do everything up there. Um, uh, we, th she had some limitations from the, the double mastectomy, but we just do some basic shoulder mobility stuff. She's fine. So she can throw med balls. She can do side toss. None of that's a problem. What about, uh, what are we doing for lower body power, anything? Um, I had her initially just on the shuttle um, because we were able to do like hops and jumps on there until we were able to get back to doing impact work. Cool. Uh, did you pair that like a core corrective with that, more ankle stuff? Uh, um, so I had her doing some basic anti-extension stuff, so planking. Um, bear hold, stuff like that, where she was able to continue to work on pelvic control. Um, question from Eugenia said, are, are all clients that are placed in groups going through that assessment? What we do with uh, large group clients, not like not small semi-private personal training, but the type of setting this woman was in, um, if they're not coming to see someone like me because they have a pain issue, they're someone who's asymptomatic, they go through an entry level adult program um, for, what is it? So two, they go through for six weeks. Um, so essentially what they're doing is they go through um, an entry level program while everyone else is going through whatever phase they're going through and they cover things like hinging, squatting, planking, uh, all the basic movements before we bring them into whatever phase everyone else is doing. Um, and ideally those people are identified and then we have a intern uh, to be able to watch them or a head coach to be able to watch them while the intern watches everybody else. So they go through what we call an entry level adult program. Um, another question, hey, do you guys repeat SFMA after six weeks, eight weeks, certain level of improvement? Um, I, re I look at their, it's from Chris, oh, hey, 2014 intern class. Uh, so Chris, um, I, I look at their, their DNs and their DPs, like their dysfunctional, non-painful, and their dysfunctional, painful uh, patterns every single time uh, they come in. So if there's someone, this woman was seeing me one day a week in addition to coming to groups, every time she came in, I looked at her toe touch, I looked at her extension. Um, and I looked at her squat along with the breakouts, like going in closer and looking at the joint itself. So rather than that way, I could just see every single time, Hey, let me see you touch toes. Let me see you do your extension. That way I can get it looked at really quickly. Um, and there, David, why no pails and rails? Um, no. So I did the pails and rails. I, I, I don't just use, I don't use the FRC terminology, so to speak. I just, uh, I, I have her do all her stretching is, is active stretching a la FRC. So her 90-90 hip stretch is, con I, I don't want to say contract or last because I know they, for, they don't really like that terminology. But um, I had her actively do what you would term as pails and rails in her 90-90 stretch in her hip rock. And especially in her ankle mobility, I do a box ankle mobility where she's actively contracting and then actively pulling herself in, um, as well as the uh, controlled articular rotation. So I just try not to use the, the, the terminology because uh, it gets confusing if you haven't taken things like FRC saying things like pails or rails just can throw some people off. But yeah, I mean, all stretching should be done active um, in any case. So uh, it would be done uh, what people would consider to be pails and rails. Uh, question for you. Would you consider her movement prep pretty much stays the same for both days, two days a week? Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty much always the same. Got it. Okay. So movement prep is the same. I'm just going to put, so this is day one over here, day one, and this is day two. And I'm just going to put a big ditto on the, on the other side. Because mm -hmm. she knows, exactly, like you were saying, you've got it down to kind of a science where you're super specific and know exactly what she needs each workout. Um, so day one for our upper body and lower body explosive and plank, we have chest pass, shuttle jump. If you don't know what a shuttle jump, basically it's a de-weighted jump on your back on a machine that kind of helps you uh, take some of the pressure off your back and your joints. And so that jump, and remember jump is two legs. On the second day, we're gonna do a shuttle hop, which is on one leg. And then we have plank one day, and then we have bear holds the other day. So we've got two days of training there. Chest pass and side toss are gonna be for three sets of eight. Shuttle jump's gonna be for three sets of eight. Shuttle hop will be three sets of five. Plank will be for 30 seconds, bear and hold, bear hold will be for 30 seconds. How did I pick those numbers? So uh, I'm currently writing a book right now, and one of the chapters that I have is about 
creating a program and how do you decide what sets and reps those are. I start, we start everybody at eight reps to keep it super simple. Why eight reps? Eight reps is where you get hypertrophy, but it's also where you get learning because you need enough reps over a period of time in order to learn something. So if you have eight reps, if it's a big compound movement, like a squat or a deadlift, I want to go heavier. So week one is eight, week two is seven, week three is six, week four is five. We don't go any lower than five reps because then for us, you're just chasing numbers. It's not worth the risk or the reward unless you are a power lifter. For everyone else, you're just someone who wants to be healthy and, or be an athlete. If it's a, an accessory or a core exercise, you're gonna go up from eight. So week one will be eight, week two will be 10, week three will be 12, week four will be 14. So core, corrective, and assistant exercises go up in reps. Big compound movements, your chin-ups, your, uh, your squats, your deadlifts, your single leg deadlifts, uh, your rear foot elevated split squats all go down in reps because we wanna go heavier. So some exercises are better for heavier, some better exercises are for endurance, but a real simple rule is to just start everybody at eight reps for pretty much everything. Um, okay, we've got hip dominant, knee dominant, bilateral. She, doesn't, she does bilateral squat, right? Yep, bilateral, just goblet squat, slightly elevated on a pad and with a heel lift um, to get around the ankle mobility issue and slightly elevated on a, on a pad so that she doesn't get so deep that she gets that FAI symptom. Um, and she can squat to parallel bilaterally, but she cannot split squat down to a pad. And sometimes that'll happen because you'll see when people are split squatting, even if it's that hip is in front, um, they tend to get pinching a little bit sooner. Um, whereas on a, on a bilateral squat, there's not a lot, as much stress on the hip. So that can one's she, fine for her. Can she kettlebell deadlift? Yep, kettlebell deadlift's fine. So day one is going to be goblet squat for our hip dominant, knee dominant, bilateral exercise. We're filling that bucket right now. And then kettlebell deadlift the next day. All right, next we have, and that, again, those are gonna be for three sets of eight to start. So remember, you can make things easier or harder in multitude of ways. You can add weight or add reps. So you're increasing the volume. You can add intensity. So the speed at which you lift it up. You can also add frequency and duration. So just do more of it. Then you can change the posture. You can change where the load is positioned on their body. So a goblet squat is going to be easier than a bar on your back or a weight over your head. And then the final one is the equipment that you lose. You lose, you use. So uh, for example, hugging a sandbag can actually make someone squat easier. Um, you can squat with a dumbbell, you can squat with a barbell, you can squat with a weighted vest, you can squat with thousands of different things. So the, you can make things easier or harder in a multitude of ways. Um, next we have push pull horizontal. She can do all that stuff. Yeah, no, no limitations in upper body whatsoever. Okay, so push pull horizontal, let's say um, push up one day and TRX row the other day, three sets of eight, eight, uh, anti extension. Uh, uh, real quick, I'm gonna answer, I'm gonna answer a question here. Okay. Uh, in your Bradshaw, if there was no shuttle available, would you omit lower body explosive? Possibly, if if it, they were very symptomatic, um, and you couldn't do things like skipping, uh, lateral bound tends to be one of the lowest level power exercises you can do because you can essentially make it into a single leg stance exercise where you just step side to side. That is something she can do. But we started with the shuttle, then I went to lateral bound. So if lateral bound is okay, that's very low level. Um, then I would start to do things like skipping. If you didn't have an option to do those, I would, I would pull that out because once they start to get stronger eccentrically and you improve any of the joint limitations like the ankle mobility limitation, then maybe you're able to start accessing that. So, yep, uh, if you didn't have a shuttle and you couldn't do some of those options, I, I would pull it out. Yeah, and I would, like Kevin said, just get stronger. So we know that uh, eccentric strength is what allows you to accept yourself when you jump. So if I was to throw a water balloon or an egg at you or Kevin, you would catch it by accepting the load. When you jump, so if I'm here and I jump and I land nice and soft, like in a depth jump, I'm learning how to catch myself. 
That's eccentric strength. So you have to be strong before you can be powerful. I've never met a powerful weak person. They don't exist. You can't have power without strength because you have to be able to accept the load of the ground. So just get them stronger, I guess is my answer. <laughs> I know, I'm not gonna get into them all. Uh, so we have now anti-extension. Is she, can she do wheel rollouts, ball rollouts? Where'd you go with her? Uh, we started with just basic planking because one of the main things as far as like uh, improving the hip health in the, the low back pain was kind of secondary to that. Um, was improving that control of her pelvis in the sagittal plane. So things like planking and bear hold and uh, things like even a stick dead bug on her back was something like supported um, that, that I added in because anything to start to just teach her uh, what, you know, I don't like, again, using terminology specifically uh, from certain thought processes like because it puts us in buckets, but zone of opposition or alignment between her pelvis and rib cage would be a better way to say it. Um, being able to work on that. So any of that anti-extension stuff was good, just lower level progressions rather than higher level. Got it. So um, this is what I'm doing right now. She is going to do, well, because you already have front plank and bear hold up here with the explosive. Uh, I put in dead bug and lying hip flexion down here. Okay, cool. As, as, those are anti, as anti extension drills. Um, yeah, those are, and those are things that we did. So those that's right. great. They're very low level because you're on your back when you're doing them. So you can't really mess stuff up when you're on your back. The only way to get hurt on your back is if something falls on top of you. Um, okay, and then our extra open exercise is your extra ankle work. Mm -hmm. Uh, how many sets and reps on the lying hip flexion, Kevin? Uh, typically, either two to three sets. We maybe start with sets of eight, 10, 12, 14. We built, that's something I build volume on, like Brendan said, with the assistant type stuff. Um, usually, holds or marches? Um, I have her, I'll have her do like a hold for a second and then back down. So she's doing multiple reps, yeah. typically attached to a Kaiser or a band off of a rack. Um, and when you have people with like FAI issues, hip, uh, hip flexion centric pain issues, reestablishing their ability to flex their hip while, like Brendan said, maintaining, uh, fighting that anti extension, like being able to maintain that uh, neutral position while they flex the hip is really important. So that's something that we would use. Um, Rob Ferrari asks based on her pain, would you start eccentric with her for lower body rather than performing regular reps? Um, if for someone who can just enter into it, um, I'm fine with starting concentric. If she was dealing with like a tendonitis issue somewhere, something where there was like a, a patellar tendonitis, I would start isometric and eccentric because you want to reestablish that tissue quality. She didn't really have an issue as far as a uh, tendonitis issue as much as she just had. Uh, we had to improve the joint movement quality in that hip and that ankle. But if she was dealing with a, like a, a knee tendonitis or something like that, I might actually start eccentric. Cool. So I'm going to skip this third set because we're already, so if we're doing all this and that, and we have conditioning, we probably only have an hour here. Mm -hmm. I'll save this third quad set for more of an athlete group. So again, cool. remember, because I have it up here as a template, doesn't mean you have to fill in every box. Now, uh, she has two days of conditioning. What are you going to have her do since we don't want her running? What mm -hmm. type of low impact stuff is she going to be doing and what sets and reps and time? Yep. So uh, one, on day one, we did a salt bike. So she started um, by doing like uh, interval work where she was essentially sprinting for, uh, we were doing 10 twenties. And uh, so 10 on 20 off at 120% of her max aerobic speed. So we found out what her max aerobic speed was. Um, and she did eight sets of that. Yep. And then next day. Uh, yep. And so this is where I had to make an adjustment because like most of the group was doing the 10 twenties on the bike. Right? right. Um, whereas on day two, the rest of the group would be doing tempos. Right. Um, so I, what I had her do was longer steady bike rides to get, just do some basic aerobic to kind of stimulate her running. Like I wanted her to kind of recreate her running experience. So we would do something like, three to five miles 
on uh, Salt Lake um, to try to at least get her have that same type of experience that she looked for out of running until she can get back to running. And that's uh, so, about what, 12 to 20 minutes? On the yeah, issue? something like that. Yeah, right. she was about 15 minutes. Okay. Um, great. Now, here's the thing, too, is there are hundreds, if you've ever been on YouTube, has anyone here ever been on YouTube? There's about 100,000 other exercises that fit in each of these categories. So I saw somebody ask about, what about glute bridges? Love glute bridges. They're amazing. They would go under hip dominant bilateral. They could also be a warm-up exercise here. Uh, again, we only have two days, and we only have an hour each day, so we're not going to be able to get in everything that we want to get in, but maybe, right? So I think we need to talk about phases. So this is phase one. And when I say phase one, a phase will generally last three to four weeks. So that means phase two, the next three to four weeks, we're going to progress a lot of these items. Now, some of the things she'll be able to progress on. So maybe she's going to be doing uh, half kneeling side toss with one knee down, and then we can move her to standing side toss. Or we can, she's kettlebell deadlifting three by eight. Maybe we go to three by 10 or three by 12, or we go maybe to a trap bar or something. If that's something that we want to pursue later on, if she's earned the right to do that. So there's lots of ways to progress these things, but we progress them every three to four weeks because that's about how long it takes you to get good at something. Mm -hmm. So, and to uh, said principle, adaptations mm -hmm. to impose demands. So it, you'll, between four and six weeks is how long it'll take your body to adapt to the program that you're doing. Um, two questions, a couple questions I'm gonna answer here. Um, Raul asked, do you ever, why did you ever kill about that? She couldn't touch her toes. She, th this was one of those toe touch situations that with the breathing with cat camel, um, in the toe touch corrective, she was able to touch. So I taught her to hinge when we started deadlifting within like a, a week, it wasn't someone who she didn't really have a limitation. Uh, so one of those hard limitations, it was, it was difficult to get her to touch her toes. I got her to touch her toes in like a session. Um, and then I wanted to keep deadlifting. She still had limitations in hip flexion uh, issues. So like split squat was still on the no-go list for her. But I got her to, to be able to touch her toes, got her to hinge, and we started deadlifting. So we wanted to try to get that going. Um, a note on the glute bridges uh, from Susan, uh, Suzanne, is we did those in the warm-up. We did that as part of her motor control. Um, and eventually we started adding that in as like a loaded exercise, like Brendan said, in phases. Um, and then Chantel ask any reason why they should do explosive before strength and power. Um, we always try to do exercises that have a higher neurological demand, like heavy implement power, plyos, med ball, sprinting, prior to getting to the weight room and doing heavy implement power things like clean. So we're gonna have them do higher velocity movements first and move towards lower velocity, higher power, higher, higher force movements second, because of the drain on the nervous system. If we were to have them do like heavy deadlifts and squats and then have them sprint, then we're going to get diminishing returns with the sprints where the, the, the same is not necessarily true going the other way. So pretty good rule of thumb with us generally is that we do the higher velocity stuff first and then move towards, uh, move towards the strength work. A side note uh, on the kettlebell deadlift. Also remember you can kettlebell deadlift with a raised kettlebell. So you can raise the kettlebell on a yoga block. So say they can't touch their toes. If they're like an inch or two away from the ground, you can raise that kettlebell up to them. Um, so you can still kettlebell deadlift, even if you don't have a toe touch, you just bring the bell closer to them so that they don't have to compensate in order to get it. Okay. Uh, pretty, uh, I, I think maybe I kind of run through, there's some more questions in this Q and a, yeah. Um, so it might be better being as that we're only going to have till seven 30, it'd be good to kind of shut the book on this one and then see how far we get into the next one. So do you think that if I just answer some of these questions here, go for it. Yeah. Um, Saw so that one. We answered hip flexion work. Uh, hi, uh, from Vin in Brazil. Shoulder mobility every day. Uh, yeah, I mean, she was, we weren't focusing on her as far as this case study, mainly because, like, she had great shoulder mobility. So we were, we were pressing overhead. We were pulling. We were doing push-ups. We were doing rows. 
it, with the warm up, she did things like floor slides. She did things like T spine every day, and that was fine. But they, there wasn't really a limitation for us to have to pursue there. Um, I think a lot of people forget that if you if you strength train correctly, you get full, you get stretching, right? If I do a full range of motion, single leg deadlift, that is a great hamstring stretch. If I do a loaded rear foot elevated split squat with a hundred pounds in each hand, that is a loaded quad stretch. If I dead hang, if I do a dead hang on my chin ups and go sternum to bar, that is a full lat stretch. So if you keep it, you won't lose it. But if you don't use it, you lose it. So the, full strength training. So like you're saying, she had great shoulder mobility. We didn't need to spend any time on that. If we just strength train her properly using all of our patterns, she'll never lose her shoulder mobility. Mm -hmm. um, and you're much better served spending like your time, like you said, filling the ankle and the hip bucket because those are her problems. Yep. Uh, Jen Rudy had asked, uh, do you tend to teach RKC plank or traditional front plank for beginner clients? I'd say how we plank all the time is what you would call like an RKC plank. Um, again, I try to just just call it a plank, but yeah, I mean, they, we teach them to actively create tension um, throughout the movement the entire time, as opposed to them like hanging out there all the time. So breath and anterior tension. Um, Brad Gallagher, uh, with her having past history of running regularly and lack of mobility in the ankle, did she ever suffer pain or problems with her Achilles? If not, did you work on uh, strengthening Achilles to be on the safe side? She didn't actually come in with any Achilles pain. Most of her pain was pretty central to where she had the uh, repair on her ankle, which was the lateral aspect. Um, but she had tension pretty much in that entire lower quarter um, as far as the tissue, tissue uh, stiffness is concerned. So, um, yeah, and she did get Achilles strengthening in that once we started being able to do impact, we did a lot of uh, skipping and pogoing and things like that. So she could, one, just do the active warm-up, but two, so she could start to have some elastic stretch. So when Brendan talks about phases, right, like we, initial phase, we didn't do any plyos or impact at all because it just didn't feel good to her. Um, but once we got the, some regular joint mobility in there, we started skipping. We started doing pogos. We started doing plyos and stuff like that. And that is how she started to get some adaptation in the lower leg um, there. So probably phase two into phase three. And now her regular training program revolves around her doing that stuff and warming up before she runs doing that stuff and things like that um we had a great question from somebody that was uh where is it milan asked said principle how can you adapt to something if you're only doing it two times per week love it uh yeah when you uh barely do anything which is 90 percent of our clients uh you adapt because when you do nothing and you go to doing something uh, when your soreness starts to go away, which is about week four or five or six, you are adapting to what we're asking you to do. Now, does the said principle work for elite athletes who are training? Uh, if you're an elite athlete and you have great genetics and you're fit and you train twice a week, you don't have anything to adapt to. So when I say said principle for somebody who trains twice a week, this case study example for somebody who only runs and lifts no weights, lifting weights, she's going to adapt to that in four to six weeks. I am not saying that she is an elite athlete who uh, needs four to five or six days a week of training in order to adapt to it. So remember, you've got to put said principle context to the person that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really important. When you work with general population, especially like this woman never lifted weights before. Um, so she gets, she can get better doing things two days a week for a long time because it's so much, her training age is so low. Like Brendan talks about being a bucket filler. Her bucket's empty in strength. Her bucket was empty in mobility too. She never like actively moved her joints, like done active joint circles and active stretching like this before she just ran. So her bucket was so empty. We have a lot of time to fill it. And then when you think about with general pop also, like what they want and economically what they can pay for. It's not necessarily what we would expect out of ourselves. Like a lot of you people listening, if you're strength coaches, like you like lifting weights, like you want to train four or five days a week because you like it, right? A lot of, this woman's a teacher. She, she, she even says to me, like, I don't like lifting weights. Like she's like, oh, I guess I'll come and train because uh, she knows it's good for her and she likes the people that work at the gym. But like it would not be their ideal thing. So you have like at some point, you're just maintaining those qualities for those people so that they can keep 
they, she doesn't necessarily want to run 10 miles. Ever. She just wants to run three miles three times a week and not have pain. And like, that's her ceiling for her because that's not really what they want. So you, know, you always have to kind of adjust your, your expectation and, and get them. Like she just wants to be pain free doing those activities. Um, is there a time limiting, uh, is there a limiting factor one hour? Or are you better off getting a better variety of exercises when it sets two to three or less exercises? Um, well, I think initially I, I try to think of almost along the lines of that um, intro level workout, like Brendan said, like those were the pretty, that was pretty meat and potatoes. We squatted, we deadlifted, we did anti-extension, we pushed and we pulled. Right. And, and, and that was kind of a basic outline and maybe eventually we did single leg deadlift. And so we can start to get more in as we go. They kind of earn their way into a more advanced program. Um, and we go from there. Margaret asked, would you do these two workouts for all phase one? Yes. We would do all these workouts for phase one for four weeks. So she would get this workout, uh, each workout four times over a four week period. Or you could move this out to six weeks and she'd get six of each workout so that she got really good at it mm -hmm. and then and progress to phase two. And to make a note too, like, so that that's essentially pretty close to what she was doing in the group two days a week. Um, but with, she would see me one day a week, one-on-one -on -one in the clinic. And then I would take her out to the gym. So she'd see me in the clinic for part of the time. And then we go out to the gym part of the time. And then they, that's when we would start feeding in those new exercises in my context. That's when I would feed in new exercise in the clinic. Oh, hey, we got to single leg deadlift today. Looked pretty good. Maybe we work this into one of the days of the week. And again, I could go talk to one of her coaches and say, hey, why don't we work in single leg deadlift? Or why don't we work in um, an assisted split squat? That's what we started to do once our split squat felt better. A split squat with a pad and a TRX. And then we worked in that, right? So I've, we'd feed in those things as she started to look better with me in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Do we use paper? How do you track programs? Personally, I'm a paper and pen guy. Um, we still have paper folders. Uh, with athletes, we make the athletes write in all of their uh, exercises and stuff on sheets, and we keep the sheets. With our adults, our adults don't care. They, we've tried to make them do sheets. We, they, most of them can't see the sheets. They don't want to do it. They have one hour. They bitch about having to do the sheets. All they care about is getting their workout in. And then what I do personally as the coach is I pick two or three exercises a workout and I say, hey, I want everyone to tell me what they kettlebell deadlift today and how many push-ups they got. And I want to see your last set. And then I record that. And then next week I either do it again or in four weeks I say, hey, today we're going to do kettlebell deadlift again. And then the next workout I say, hey, today I want to know what you goblet squat and what your one mile bike ride time was. So I pick the focus and then I keep the weights. Most of your clients honestly don't give a shit. So you have to make them care, but they're not going to record it themselves. Yes, you have those clients that bring in their workout journal and they write it in every single workout and everything they ate that day. But most of your people aren't going to want to do that. So again, mm -hmm. we're always thinking 80-20 and 80-20 is where you make most of your money. Um, helping those people, especially as a trainer if they're going to be paying you that type of money. Um, was she able to do a sort of low box step up, Kevin, heel touch rather than a split squat? Um, so we didn't, I didn't ever had her try to do low box step ups or, or heel touch or anything. What we essentially did is I just said, let's get the hip normal in as far as like her range of motion goes. Like, can I bring her passively in the flexion without pain? Once we could start to do that, then I started having her do, assisted split squat and we were fine. So I, I never really had to try to dig that deep for an alternative unilateral drill because we just trained bilateral for a few weeks and she could still single leg deadlift. Um, and then once she could, the hip uh, range of motion was normal, then I started to feed the unilateral stuff because for me, I wanted to make sure the mobility of that hip was normal before I had her start to try to do anything unilateral on that side. Um, so I, I never actually tried any step ups. Let's try to do one more program here. Okay. Before we go, we got 20 minutes. What? Yeah, you have 15 minutes. I can program that fast. Let's do it. Sure. Right, you want me to bring up the case study? Yeah, bring up two. All right, so this is a baseball I'll player. This is the second one. And this is an athlete, so I want everyone to see an athlete. I can stay on and answer questions afterwards when you have to piece. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so case study two, 17-year-old baseball player, right-handed pitcher. Um, 
training. Uh, he came start. He's trained four days a week in the summer, two or three days a week in season, preseason. So uh, depending on the part time of the year, anywhere from four to days to two or three days. With the once the pitching started, we had to kind of pull back a little bit. Um, like most 17-year-old pitchers, number one goal was to gain weight, improve his strength and power, um, improve his pitching performance. Also, uh, he had had some right soreness in his shoulder and pain um, just from the amount of volume of throwing he had been doing. And I'll get, we'll get into specifically what that was when we get to the next page. Um, subjectively, when I kind of asked him, hey, like, what are your outcomes? He said, like, I, my right shoulder is just achy, get some pain through the pec, collarbone, uh, rib cage area. Um, but he really wanted to bring his velocity up. This is a kid that's, you know, he's 5'10", 160 pounds roughly. Um, and he had, he had, when I say objectively, what was he being dealt with? He had a thoracic outlet, brachial plexus issue he had been seeing a PT for and still just not completely resolved. So we wanted to put some meat on his bones, so to speak, um, and, and just get some regularity in that shoulder. Um, I mean, he's someone who has a lot of layback, like you see in this picture. So just obviously there's going to be some abnormal stresses in that shoulder, but nothing too crazy. Um, no training history, very low training age. Um, so we had a lot to work with. Again, big empty bucket. Um, at, during preseason, like I said, two or three days a week when baseball was about three or four days a week. But then in the end, we would flip the other way in the offseason. So we would go training four days a week and his baseball would be down to two or three. Um, and, and like any strength coach now, I'm constantly battling with the parents um, and with the club coaches in like, they want him to throw every day, all freaking year, which is insane. So I'm constantly trying to educate him, educate the parents, get them to pull back on the amount of bullpen time. Cause I think a lot of the problems he had in his shoulder were pure volume throwing issues is why he was dealing with things. So a, a big part of our programming was education as far as teaching them. Listen, we got to kind of tone down the throwing. You don't need to throw all year long. Um, looking at a squat, uh, overhead squat uh, was a big one, uh, mainly because of core stability. It wasn't He's not stiff. I mean, he's a 17-year-old boy. He, his hips aren't stiff. If I look him on the table, it's fine. Uh, he had shoulder mobility issues, um, specifically in that right side um, that we needed to work through, um, and mainly core stability issue, which is also, I think, why his shoulder kind of propped up is because he's just generally, uh, as Mike always says, like he's got a bad case of weakness. Um, uh, push up was a one, uh, be it one is just generally kind of weak. Uh, core stability was poor, and a shoulder mobility is a one on the right, two on the left. Um, so there were just some things we had to work with, uh, we had to improve there, but nothing really crazy. Um, just, just generally weak, no training history, overall needed strength in core, core strength and upper body strength. Uh, lower body strength wasn't terrible, but I mean, obviously could get way better, um, but noticeably lacking upper body and core strength. So pretty straightforward um, assessment, which is going to come up, be a much different kind of outcome for him. Do note that he was dealing with some pain in the shoulder and that we had a unique situation with him being a pitcher. Got it. All right. You want to stop sharing your screen? Yep. All right. Let's do this. So uh, we have three days here. We're going to go linear emphasis, lateral emphasis linear emphasis on the other day next week would go lateral linear lateral but for the purpose of this i'm going to break it out with two linear days so this linear day is just going to be the same as this one right here so you will alternate linear and lateral days with an athlete adults just do both together they don't need separate days they're not doing any true speed work because of the risk of injury um, so soft tissue stuff, was there any extra soft tissue stuff you did with him other than just foam roll? Yeah, specifically for the shoulder, um, if, uh, looking at the mobility, like uh, the foam rolling, we did a lot of work in the posterior shoulder aspect, like pinning and stretching, uh, pec underneath that um, collarbone, like um, in that like subclavius muscle, subscap, like all around the shoulder front and back because he had the thoracic outlet type stuff uh a lot of kind of anterior compression of the rib cage that we had to work through so i just did a lot of rolling in there um and just stemming from that as you write that brad atkinson uh asked for an athlete with thoracic outlet can lead to history of neck uh neck tweaks and pain 
absolutely. Typically what I find, um, and I'm not a PT, like he came from a PT. I spoke with the PT. I assessed him. This was a collaborative effort and, and I didn't diagnose him with thoracic elbow. He came to me with it. Um, a lot of compression of the nerve bundles and brachial plexus here. So he had subclavius pressure, pec, subscap, a lot of breathing work to try to open that up, which is kind of counterintuitive. Sometimes everyone says, oh, don't breathe through here. Well, he had no, he had like a sunken chest. So I had to get him to breathe and, and open some of that stuff up. And it can lead to stuff in the, the scalenes and the neck and uh, SCM. So yeah, I, I, it could definitely be connected. I just put breath work and motor control. Uh, any specific stretches or just your typical stretch hips, ankle, hips, ankles, and shoulders? Any specific yep. stretches? A couple outside the norm, yeah. Uh, sleeper stretch for the shoulder. He was very limited in internal rotation, as you'd expect with a right-handed pitcher. Um, pec stretching um, on the roller, like the snow angels, essentially, where he's actively pressing into the floor. Yeah. Um, and active breathing with a, like a lat stretch, so with the band um, and trying to pull down. Just because that shoulder was just uh, pretty jacked from all the volume. Got it. Motor control. Um, supine. Nothing really out of the ordinary. Out of the ordinary. Supine breathing, floor okay. sliding, leg lowering, all the normal stuff in the group, really. Got it. So breath work, floor slide, leg lower. We'll say lunge circuit. Okay, and dynamic warm up. Typical, just linear warm up, lateral warm up. Yeah, pretty typical. Okay. If anyone wants to know what the whole linear warm up and lateral warm up is, type in on YouTube MBSC linear warm up and then MBSC lateral warm up. A uh, couple quick questions and answer I'll get to. Jen, Jennifer Machu said uh, different conditioning for baseball, softball players, coaches I work with want them to run. What's your stance on that? I want him to row. Um, no, I, no different really. They, he still runs, runs tempos, does sprints. Um, does slide board, especially as a pitcher, I want him doing slide board in the frontal plane. So nothing different as far as conditioning goes, um, but definitely sprint focus, not uh, long focus. But no, I did not have him row. Uh, Jamie Del Rosario said, "What different when you're differentiating between adults and athletes? Where do weekend warriors, adult competitors, age group players, or uh, fall? Is there in between group when it comes to programming? This can be difficult um, because." We have a lot of adults who are perfectly happy being in an adult group. Like we said, like they, they don't have aspirations of being like a weekend warrior. They just want to feel better and that's fine. But then you have some people who want a little bit more and sometimes we'll give them like kind of like a little bit of a tweak of their program. Like I'll be like, Hey, yeah, you know, why don't we work in this for a few weeks? And I'll, I'll kind of be, those are the people like Brendan said that bring a notebook or print want the program print. Right. Less than 5% of your people. Yeah. And those people will just create, uh, create some tweaks. I, in the summer, sometimes have some of those weekend warriors join my college group. Um, like I had two women who were in their 40s in my college athlete group this summer. Not common whatsoever, but they, they wanted to work on that stuff. And they're both like competitive athletes. Um, and so they worked out with the college kids. Um, and, and we'll make those tweaks because they're not that common. Um, but, but when you do have it, we'll, we'll, we'll accommodate them because we have their customers, their brand customers. We want to make them happy uh, and do so. So um, let's get into the lift quick before I got to run here. So um, upper body explosive. We didn't have to make any changes, even though we had the complaints about the shoulder. It's all asymptomatic when he throws med balls and med ball throwing was important to him. Um, it's important to me. Um, it's also something that I identified that he saw value in as an athlete. And part of getting people to buy in the program is giving them things that they see value in. So, and those were all asymptomatic for him. So we did overhead throwing. We did, we actually did one arm chest pass specifically um, because he was a pitcher. That was like a small tweak I made. Um, so day one, I have overhead throw. Day two, I have side toss. And day three, I have chest pass with one arm. So what do we got for lower body power? Uh, hop, bound, and jump in different varieties each day. So one would be a hop, one would be a jump, one would be a bound. So box jump, lateral bound, and medial lateral hops. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna kick. We're gonna 
skip core corrected here so we can get to lifting because just, and just as a note um he would sprint because he was an athlete that's like when we have our sprinting work so he was essentially doing time sprints instead of that core corrective stuff anyway so flying 10s flying 15s things like that let's put that then so flying 10 and then just would you say flying 15 or just a regular sprint? He, he was he was doing 10 yard sprints every day he came in and then with, with the way our progression for sprinting goes is like go from a a, a a dead start 10 yard sprint to a flying sprint to like you work your way through so he was dead but he's sprinting like all our athletes he's mainly a pitcher but to get more output in his nervous system we're still sprinting every day no matter what and then what's the lateral sprint now um well so on lateral days we'll work on things like crossovers okay so just a reminder to everyone, we have two linear days and then our lateral days. So side toss, lateral bound, and crossover are all lateral drills. So they fit in on lateral day, and then we have two linear days here. Just throwing that out there. Um, okay, bilateral hip dominant, we'll say trap bar, right? Uh, well, so just uh, for a note, because he was in the athlete group, right, yep. um, he would be doing some sort of heavy implement power. Uh, because, you know, most of the athletes would be hand cleaning, right? Yeah. Um, but an important note, him as a baseball player, he's not going to hand clean. Um, so he kettlebell, he would do kettlebell swings both days. Okay. KB swing. Uh, with baseball players, we tend to try to avoid. Um, and then the middle day, I would have them do loaded jump squats. We tend to avoid having to do hand cleans with baseball players, pitchers, um, uh, tennis athletes, people who rely on – hand elbow and wrist health um with baseball we tend to avoid it there's always already a lot of uh distractive stress on the shoulder from them throwing having them hang clean tends to tends to add to that so we tend to just find a power alternative for the for throwing athletes uh athletes who are very dependent on hand wrist and elbow and shoulder specifically Got it. And did you do X, did you do any overhead pressing with him or did you avoid overhead pressing? No, we did like uh, landmine and push up. Okay. So landmine. I tend to try to avoid um, overhead pressing. Um, and I try to avoid pressing where their scapula is going to be pinned um, because I want them to be able to get upward rotation, protraction, retraction. So as opposed to things like bench press, I tend to choose push up. I, ch I tend to choose landmine press. I tend to choose cable press. Do you do chin up with him? Uh, no, X pull down, Got row, it. any rowing variation. Okay, X pull down. So what I got here then is I got kettlebell swing with dumbbell row. Then I got TRX row with loaded jumps on day two. Um, KB swing. What other horizontal row can we do? Like a cable row? Cable row would be fine. Cable row. All right. Uh, anti extension with him. We got like ball rollout, wheel rollout. Uh, yeah. He, rollout. Once we worked on basic core strength, he could start to do ball rollouts and, and, and things like that. Okay. Ball rollout. Body saw. And I, pr I actually did. I would probably do ball rollout twice a week with him because it was something we had to work on for a while okay. um, because it was so hard for him to have sagittal control of his spine and his pelvis. We did that pretty frequently. Got it. Did you do any like extra stuff in between, like more pec or cuff stuff? Yeah, yeah more shoulder mobility. Okay. Shoulder move. Shoulder move. Um, okay. What were the big uh, unilateral lifts with him? Um, unilateral, we, we did RFEs, we did sled marching, we did single leg deadlift. All right, sled march. So just for context, I gave, uh, on the open exercise, I gave him shoulder mobility stuff every day, uh, rear foot elevated split squat. So now we're on three a, so our third quad set. Rear foot elevated split squat one day, sled march the other day, and single leg deadlift the other day. Mm -hmm. uh, and then his push is going to be landmine press, push up, and then X pull downs for his vertical push 
push pull. Um, anti rotation, we'll do holds. Uh, did he do suitcase carries or anything? Uh, yeah, he did a lot of carries actually because of the ad, the overall strength, core stability, and shoulder stability that you get from it. Um, before I have to get off here, I'm going to try to answer a couple questions real quick. So, yeah. softball pitchers, okay to do hand cleans. Again, um, when they're younger, if anybody's really young, whether it's baseball, soccer, whatever sport, I don't turn, I don't cue them as that athlete. I just think of them as athlete. Once they start to get older, 15, 16, 17, 18, then maybe I start to pull things out. So maybe an older softball pitcher, I might pull it out and just have them do swings. And I tend to like swings better for translation to rotational power sports anyways. Um, so I kind of like that adjustment for hand cleans. Um, if an athlete's working with you multiple days in a row, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, sometimes maybe you just uh, switch an exercise here or there. But in the grand scheme of things, it's probably not a huge deal as long as you're kind of monitoring how sore they are. Um, opposed to kettlebell snatch, knowing it's technically overhead, probably wouldn't do it. Even if you think like, hey, I might get some good shoulder stability out of kettlebell snatch or dumbbell snatch, it's never worth it if it goes wrong because you're going to be the first one to hear about it from a coach or from a parent if they're like, oh, I told you they shouldn't have done anything overhead. I like swings um, a, a, as a power exercise for most rotational power athletes anyways. So, Real quick, can you answer conditioning for him? So two linear days and one lateral day conditioning. Slide board lateral day? Uh, slide, board, uh, uh, slide board and bike was on the lateral day. It's pretty typical for our athlete program. Bike for how long? Uh, he would do the interval work and then do inter he would do interval work on the slide board as well as interval work on the bike. So like 10, 20s on the bike and then uh, 20 seconds on, about a minute off on the uh, slide board. Okay, and then linear days, run? Uh, he he'd run both tempos in phase one and then shuttles when he got to phase two. Okay, got it. If you need to hop off, I can answer the rest of the questions. Yeah, I think. All right, guys, thank you. Uh, we'll do this again next week, and I'll probably have longer next week. I just have to get on another call right now. So um, thank you very much, and uh, talk next week. Brendan, thank you. Jenny, thank you so much um, for everything. So I'm staying on if people want to ask more questions. Uh, so for anti-rotation here, uh, day three, I'm going to make that a land. Uh, yeah, let's go landmine rotations with him. Um, so then we have down here, we have our day one high impact conditioning is tempos phase one. Day two, our lateral is going to be slide board conditioning. And then day three, so like Kevin was saying, he did tempos both days, but phase two, they moved to shuttles, shuttle running. So I think the big thing to take away here is that you build a template as so on the side here. So your buckets. And then you fill those buckets almost kind of with whatever you want. So the exercises you want to use, everyone here is going to use something a little bit different than what I use um, based off of experience, based off of what courses you've taken. If you've taken the CFSC, then you understand our, our philosophy. So the big thing is that you have these buckets to fill. You have a template that you use um, consistently and that you have regressions and progressions for each exercise. So I know what to do if this exercise shouldn't work. So for example, a goblet squat is baseline where everyone starts. If you can't goblet squat, then you squat press out or you squat with your heels up, which are two really quick regressions or you assisted squat. You assist the squat with a band, a bench, a chair, whatever that is. And then you progress the squat by either adding weight, which you can do with more kettlebells, more dumbbells, more barbell, or you change the position of the load. So instead of having it on your front, you move it to the back or you go overhead. So every single exercise can be regressed and progressed just like that. And then you put it all into your template. And the cool thing about this is if you have your working template, then you know where you're starting with everybody uh, each time. So you don't have to write a brand new program every time. You just fill in the empty slots. So let's answer some questions here. Um, do you like suitcase marching? Yes, love suitcase marching. Uh, suitcase, we do suitcase carries because we have 50 yards of turf and you can walk down and back. If you don't have turf to walk down and back, 
you hold that kettlebell in place. So think of suitcase carry as a walking side plank and you just march in place. Get those knees up nice and high and then you do it for time. I usually use 30 seconds to 40 seconds. Um, any longer than that, I don't wanna watch somebody march in place for three minutes straight. So I keep it to about 30 seconds and then you just increase the weight. Um, other questions here. Is it really that easy to make a program for a professional athlete regardless of sport? Yes, it really is that easy. Again, everyone wants their sport to be different, but it's not that different. We're all human beings. We all need the same movement patterns. So I would say that for each, again, I use the 80-20 rule. If you play baseball, 20% of your program needs to be different than somebody who plays football. Football needs to be 20% 20, 20 different than someone who plays basketball. But again, we're all made up of pretty much the same muscles and bones, the same movements. We all have a neurological system, a lymphatic system, and a cardiovascular system. So this programming works for, again, 80% of your people. 20% of your people, this, this program isn't going to work for. So again, I don't want this to be, this isn't a dictatorship. This works for most, not for everybody. Um, and that's how I sell the CFSC as well. The CFSC course is not an end-all be-all. It'll great. I always say you're going to cast a really big net and you're going to catch a lot of fish, but you're not going to catch all the fish. That's where you have to go learn from other people and then sprinkle in the stuff that we do here. Um, I know you said no chin-ups. Would you do neutral grip pull-up with a baseball player or always do X pull-downs? Uh, again, like Kevin said, at 16 years old, you become an athlete. Any, anything under the age of 16, you're just a kid. So you do everything in the gym. I don't, I don't delineate if you're an athlete or, uh, until the age of 16, um, you could do neutral grip. I, I prefer if they have a full floor slide, that's my, that's my, um, uh, my tell my, my mobility drill. If they have a full floor slide, then I let them do chin-ups. Um, and I would go neutral grip chin-ups with that athlete. If they don't have a full floor slide, I don't do chin-ups because full floor slide is essentially a chin-up on your back. And if you can't do it on the ground, with gravity helping you, you're not going to stand up and magically be able to do it in a chin-up position or a pressing position. I have a second follow-up question about th thoracic outlet. If you have a client who tweaked their neck, uh, tweak their neck. Lower body work if they can handle it. Um, most of the time, I just tell them to take a couple days off. Let that nerve calm down. If you're in pain, your body's going to be guarding. And it won't necessarily let you get any better. Um, Matt, I would prefer you go for a walk. Um, just take good care of yourself and so that we can train harder later. Um, if you do want them to do something, yeah, you could stay lower body. But again, anything where you have to hold the weight is going to use that neck muscle. So most of the time, I just tell them to take the time off until they're better. Why landmine press instead of kettlebell rack? Landmine press. So the landmine press accommodates for my shoulder range of motion. So when I press a landmine, it's about 70 degrees of shoulder flexion when that AC joint starts to rub, if you should have that pinching pain. So notice my end range of motion not using my lumbar spine is about ooh, like 75, 80 degrees. I shouldn't be pressing overhead because the only way I can get my arms over my head because my shoulder mobility is so bad, that is a one, and then a really bad one on the FMS. My, if I press over my head, I have to use my low back. So the landmine press accommodates for that lack of range of motion. When you program the rear foot, do you program that with a single leg squat in the same program? Yeah, uh, same program, just different days. So the question was, do you do rear foot elevated split squats and single leg squats in the same program, or do you do that in different phases? So Day one might be rear foot elevated split squats here. And then day three might be our single leg squats. So we do both. Um, most people progress to rear foot elevated split squats quicker than they do to single leg squats because of the difficulty of the exercise. For an athlete on this three-day program, will you essentially repeat three-day exercises for the entire phase? Yes, we repeat the same exact exercises for all four weeks so the, you get really, really good at them. And then once four weeks comes, we 
either progress the exercises for another four weeks, or if you haven't mastered it yet, you do it again for another four weeks. So you have two options. You can go to a progression or you can stay on the same, uh, same line or same path that you were already on in the last phase. That way it makes our programming next phase a little bit easier because I know what you did last phase, so we can either do the same thing or I know exactly what my progressions are gonna be for the next one. How would you fit this one hour program in a team setting with limited time? I wouldn't do all this. I would do about half of this in a one hour program in a team setting. So I would do, uh, so movement prep, power, strength and conditioning. I would probably bring it all down to, I would just squeeze it and take a bunch, a couple of these things out. I'd still do maybe, I'd probably get rid of foam rolling and just stretch instead. Uh, I would probably get rid of a lot of the motor control stuff and go to dynamic warm up. I would make sure, again, if you lift weights properly, you warm up, you condition, you get all of your stretching in, right? Because uh, again, a loaded split squat in a good position is a loaded quad stretch, if you really think about it. So proper strength training will always be that, be the glass for me that you want to fill up. That's my main bucket always. Uh, if I'm limited on time, again, if I'm limited on time. Do you use swings and loaded jumps on the strength block? So swings and loaded jumps are an explosive exercise, but yes, they can be in the strength block. Here's the thing. When you know the rules, you can break the rules. So the rules here were lower body explosive. He did box jump, lateral bound, and medial lateral hurl hops but we added more explosive stuff because he was an athlete and a good athlete that needed it into our strength block. That's perfectly okay. Again, when you know the rules, you can break the rules and it's your template. So now remember, you don't have to fill all of these up and you can always put in something else. It's just a guide so that you can make a better decision. What do you recommend for somebody who has a hard time gripping with the suitcase carry? Uh, if it's because they're weak, keep doing it. If it's because it's an actual like neurological issue, um, you could use those wrist straps that go around the kettlebell. Um, so weakness, keep going, get stronger. Uh, not a weakness, use straps so that they can still get the benefit of holding the weight out to their side. I'm gonna answer all these questions. I don't even know how many people are still on this call, but uh, avoid overhead presses or Olympic lifting with throwing athletes use primary shoulders and wrists is limited to activity or it depends on their mechanics and shoulder limitations. Um, so again, it has more, for me, it has a lot to do with their limitations, um, especially if you're younger. Now, if you are a professional athlete and you make $50 million a year on your arm, I'm not going near that arm. Um, I might keep it healthy with some rowing and pressing with cables and uh, some stuff where you definitely can't get hurt, but I am not messing with that million dollar arm. Uh, if you have a full floor slide, that's my, my tell. If you have a full floor slide, you're pretty much good to go for a lot of things. If you don't have a full floor slide or you don't have a two, two on the FMS, we're not doing anything pressing overhead. I don't care who you are, um, whether you're a professional athlete or a, a high school athlete or a volleyball player or a tennis player, um, baseball player. So. Again, this is the art of coaching piece. I don't have an exact answer. The answer really is it depends. Um, but for us, when it's a large group, it's easier to default to not doing it when it's a group of 12 to 15 athletes that play a specific sport. Um, but that, does, that means they do everything else. So that's about 20% of our program is overhead pressing and overhead rowing. Again, 80-20. So if you're an athlete, you're an athlete, you're doing the rest of the stuff, but we're gonna skip over the overhead stuff. How much recovery time between exercises, however long it takes you to get to the next thing. We don't have a specific time. Um, it's walk to the next exercise, do the next one, walk to the next one, grab a drink of water, do the next one. Empirically, we know physiologically or, or mentally when to go to the next exercise. Like we don't start the next set if we're huffing and puffing, we wait until we're done until we're ready to go again. Um, but when we have an hour, we have an hour to get a lot of this stuff in. 
Sometimes you do have to push people a little bit. Is it ideal? No. Um, ideally, you'd fully recover between everything, but that would take you four and a half hours to do one workout. When it comes to athletes who are playing two games per week, top level soccer players, how would you organize the workout? Volume, intensity, exactly what you've seen here. Two times a week, top level soccer players. Uh, top level soccer players generally have a very low training age. Um, because soccer players don't lift weights their whole life like football players do um, or other strength athletes. So honestly, it really is this right here. I might not do as much running with them since they do so much damn running anyways. Um, I would spend most of my time. So we're thinking buckets here. So if we have four buckets, we have the mobility bucket, we have the strength bucket, we have the power bucket, and we have the conditioning bucket. Soccer players already have the conditioning bucket full. The mobility bucket, you have to do an assessment or watch them move, uh, but they definitely need more strength and power almost always. Uh, when you run, or, or sorry, who gets, who, who are the best soccer players are the ones who get to the ball first, so the ones who have the most power and speed. So I would spend most of my time on power and speed um, if I had soccer players that were playing twice a week. Um, we have, do you use swings and loaded jumps? Oh, I answered that. Um, what would you do to help improve floor slide? Uh, do more floor slides. Uh, again, external rotation stretching. Uh, I like the, if you grab a PVC pipe, you can put the PVC pipe in the back of the shoulder and stretch the shoulder that way. That's a good one I've taken from um, Kelly Stretz Mobility Wad. So you've got the PVC stretch. You've also got the bench T-spine stretch. So you grab a PVC pipe, hands out, elbows on, sit your butt back. So you're trying to get that external rotation back so they can get their palms down to the ground. Um, also any thoracic extension stuff. So if I'm stuck in flexion here, it's gonna be real hard for me to get my shoulders back. Um, so more rowing stuff. Um, also, you might just never ever get it back, which is totally fine. Um, there are no floor slide Olympics. Uh, I'm not going to the Olympics for baseball or anything overhead. Uh, I just want to be healthy. So getting that shoulder range of motion or the floor slide back is ideal, but uh, there's not a whole lot of things in my life that it really affects um, personally. So again, I, will I put in the work that needs to go in to get my floor slide back? Uh, I'm a terrible client, just like all the rest of your clients. So probably not. Um, I wish I had a better answer for improving, improving floor slides, but really it's, uh, it's like building a bicep, right? You want to build your bicep. Do you do one set of curls and then your arm is huge the next day? It's the same thing for stretching and mobility work. Like it takes consistent effort three times a week for years to build big biceps. It's the same thing for getting better at floor slides or stretching. Uh, breathing before or after mobility and stretching. We do it after because nobody comes in early to do breath work. And so we have to force our breath work. So in a theoretical sense, it would be best to do breathing first, but no people come in early and foam roll and stretch, but nobody comes in early to do breath work. So we have to force them to do it after mobility and stretching. Ideally too, you would also include the breathing in your mobility work. So when I exhale and rotate on a T-spine rotation, I exhale and move. So you, when you incorporate breathing into exercises, people are way more likely to do it um, and complain about it less. Because when you're laying on your back on a gym that's bumping music, it's really hard to get into the whole breath, breath thing. So good in theory, but in practice, it can be really hard to implement breath stuff. Do you ever use contrast work? Yes, in phase four, Matt, we use contract work, contrast work. Um, so contrast work would be... Uh, for example, like you do a heavy bench press and then you throw chest pass after it and then you do push-ups and then you do uh, assisted explosive push-ups. Um, lower body would be a heavy, heavy trap bar to a vertical jump, to a kettlebell swing, to an assisted jump. Um, but again, that's phase four. So athletes don't get there until week 16. And it's athletes only. We don't do it with our adults because of the the possible tissue damage. So we do use it, but only in phase four. And most, a lot of athletes won't get there. Again, less than 20% of your, your people will get to phase four contrast work. 
So I love it, but it's not for most people. What advice do you give for not overthinking programming? This. Honestly, follow this template. Plug in your exercises. It doesn't have to be any more difficult than that. Uh, as you get better, more experience, you take more courses, you read more books, you can sprinkle in all of those things on your foundation. This to me is the foundation here. Um, I think people overthink sets, reps, times. Uh, my sport is different than your sport. Um, they go too deep into the mobility hole. Like, so make strength your main focus and then build everything around that and have a template where you plug all of your exercises in. How often are you doing inhale and rotation to get more diaphragmatic excursion as opposed to rib cage expansion? Bobby, uh, <clears throat> so here's my thing with breathing. There's, there's breathing strategies. The problem is there are people who only breathe one way. So in all of our uh, movement prep stuff, I coach a lot of the breath work. Inhale, exhale, exhale drops the rib cage down. <sighs> and move. So I want to move from a stable trunk or a trunk where the pelvis and rib cage sit on top of each other. So it's exhale and move. When I deadlift happy, heavy, you want to hold your breath. So you're going to exhale, grab that barbell or the trap bar, inhale. You want to, the Valsalva maneuver makes you stronger. Um, so when it comes to strength work, I actually have a lot of people that if it's under five reps, hold your breath. I mean, we know that makes you stronger. The problem there are people who hold their breath in order to do low level things like tie their shoes or people who sleep with their mouths open. So essentially you're basically breath holding all night long while you sleep. You're supposed to sleep and be, re be rested and breathe nice and easy. People sleep like they're deadlifting 500 pounds or running a 100-meter sprint. When you run a 100-meter sprint, the best athletes in the world only take three breaths. So breathing strategies. I want to know when I need to use my breath to drive mobility. I want to know when I use my breath uh, on high repetition exercise. If you're doing kettlebell swings for 20 reps, you better be breathing because if you hold your breath, you're going to pass out. If I'm going to let deadlift double my body weight, I better hold my breath or I'm going to maybe fold in half. So it's knowing when to use each strategy. Um, I mean, that's at least my opinion and how I use it in training. There are going to be people who don't agree with that and that's totally fine. Um, but that's how I think of breath work is it's, you need to selectively use it for each exercise or what it is you're trying to do. There isn't one right way to breathe in my opinion. Um, do you use intensity absolute or relative? Uh, we use relative intensity. Um, so again, how do you, how do you, on a scale of one to 10, how difficult or easy was that? If it's under a five, I stick with what I just did. If it's, or sorry, if it's over a five, I usually stick with whatever weight it was. If it's under a five, then I increase the weight or increase the difficulty of that exercise. Woo. I'm not going to get to all these questions. I'm going to answer. Two more. To what? Which one? Okay, so how would you adjust your athlete when your athlete is working with you multiple days in a row? Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Multiple days in a row, I, I, it pretty much stays the same as this. I got linear one day, lateral the other day. Um, I'm still following my movement, my, all my patterns. I've got uh, linear conditioning, lateral conditioning. Uh, are they going to be sore? Yes. Uh, is it ideal? No. Um, two days a week, if they're right in a row, maybe you pick a, uh, this is from Cal Dietz's stuff and triphasic training. You have a high day, a low day. Uh, Charlie Francis used to do this too. So maybe I have my linear day is going to be my really intense day with more of my neurological work. And then my second day is going to be more of our like lighter, uh, like bench press type exercises, more strength stuff and less neurological type stuff. Um, would softball pitchers be okay doing? Uh, Kevin answered that. Would you be opposed to kettlebell snatching? No, it's technically. Would you be opposed to kettlebell snatch knowing it's technically over time? We do tons of kettlebell snatch with any athlete 
who is not an overhead athlete. Um, again, if you're under the age of 16, you're just a kid. So everyone under 16 does dump, uh, kettlebell snatch one day. They do cleans the other day. Uh, if you are over 16 and you're an overhead athlete, we do not dumbbell snatch. We either do another day of cleans or we do kettlebell swing or we do a vertimax jump um, or a weighted, weighted jump. Um, so those are, those are our kettlebell snatch we do do. I just didn't have it in this program because he was a baseball player. Um, remember, this was just two case studies. Uh, there's hundreds of other exercises, bunch of different case studies that we could do. These were the two that we picked for today. Um, okay, so that's it. We still have 76 people on here, so that's pretty good. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we are going to send out, uh, everyone has access to that, um, to the program that we've built out here for those two people. Scroll down to see the uh, see case study two. And also there's a blank one because we didn't get to case study three. So you can print that out and use that for your own usage. Um, what else am I missing here? We have the CFSC course right now is $150 off if you want to take it online with all this COVID stuff going on. I have a product that I've called uh, Exercise Checklist. If you go to exercisechecklist.com, it is a bunch of uh, checklists for all these exercises or regressions and progressions of each of these with standards. And when I say standard, we know uh, organically after watching thousands and thousands of workouts and repetitions, what each person should be good at or what a good, I get the question all the time, how do I know when to progress? So we answer the question, how strong is strong enough? So if you can goblet squat 50% of your body weight for 10 reps, I would say you are strong enough for most things that you want to do in your life and strong enough to go to front squat. So 50% of your body weight goblet squat 10 times lets me ask a better question and lets me make a better decision to what we do next. And we have standards for every single exercise or main exercise that we do. So for example, a single leg deadlift, a single leg deadlift, you want to be able to do 80% of your body weight on one leg for eight reps. And yeah, that's a lot of weight. So if I'm 200 pounds, that's 80 pound dumbbells in each hand. That's 160 pounds for eight reps. Yeah, it's hard to do, but that I want it to be difficult so that you have to strive to get there because nobody comes into the gym and says, I wonder what I uh, single leg deadlift, what my max is, right? Everyone comes in, wants to know their bench press, lose 10 pounds. So I've got to make those things applicable or uh, exciting for my people. So when I put a standard there and I say, hey, if you want to be really good at this, you need to be able to do 80% of your body weight with two dumbbells on one leg for a single leg deadlift. All of a sudden, people start reaching for those standards. So you can go to exercisechecklist.com. You can find out more there. We have certifiedfsc.com as well if you want to check out the CFSC course, which is eight hours of this, but you experience it live. We go through every single one of these buckets and then show you all the regressions and progressions for each exercise. Um, I'm going to update the CFSC website with the new regression progression sheet in the next week here. I'm still finalizing it with Coach Boyle. Uh, if you want it, I can send it to you, but you can also just wait and get it on the back end of the website. Uh, Kevin and I are going to talk next week about integrating fitness with rehab. Uh, we talked a little bit about that today, but tomorrow, uh, next week will be a little bit more of a discussion, uh, a live discussion. We'll let more people in this webinar. I wanted to make sure that we got at least two of these in, um, and I will maybe even fill out the third, uh, case study here just so everyone can see that visually um okay cool thanks for watching peace out take care stay healthy um, and see you next week